Well, hello, Crossroads family. How's everybody doing in the Lord's house today? You guys are well? We'll be happy to be here. Amen. My name is Gabe Moreno. I'm one of the pastors here. And before we even get started, I would love to read the word of God together. So if you wouldn't mind standing for a moment. I know this is irregular. You can do it. Come on. We could stand. This is an ancient tradition. Early church did this. They would just read passages of scripture together. And so we're going to tap into something thousands of years in the making. But let's do it together. Much like we do the benediction, we pray this together. Some of you have your Bibles open. Um, So Psalm 23, this is a passage of scripture in this series, Wild, where we are slowing down to marinate on the beauty that is found in Psalm 23, a familiar passage for sure. Uh, And it'll also be on the screens if you don't have a Bible readily available. But let's read this together as a family of faith. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Turn to someone next to you and say, I'm glad you came today. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) You guys can go ahead and be seated. Not too friendly now, come on. on. (laughs) So good. I am thrilled that you guys are here today. You know, we are a family of faith and, and we are growing clearly, but what is it about families? A friend of mine said this. Uh, he said, what is it about families where the baby of the family is the favorite? Has anyone ever encountered that? Are you the baby of your family? Or, or better said this way, look at it this way. This, might, this way might make more sense. I know the, the, the babies of the family are getting offended here. Slow down, simmer down, simmer down. Um, a comedian said it this way. A comedian said, Have you ever noticed that you're only as happy as your grumpiest child? (laughs) Right? Like you could be at Disneyland. Okay, this happened, this actually happened to us a little while, while uh, 2020. We were able to, to, with the honor of being over there and um, we're at Disneyland, but we could only be as happy as our grumpiest child. Now the baby in the family is the grumpiest child. I don't know if that's true for every family, but that's been true in, in our situation. And, and I'm like, and it's so sad because you got, y'all know how expensive Disneyland is, right? I mean, I'm looking at my other kids. I'm like, well, you guys better enjoy this because it was either this or college, you know? Because it's like, because Disneyland expense, they'd be taxing. They're taxing at Disneyland. But uh, my youngest was, it was so annoyed. And so we're only as happy as our grumpiest child. And it's especially difficult to make her happy during dinner time. I don't know what it is about the baby of the family. She's a wild sheep. She's wild. Like the name of the series, she's wild. She doesn't like things that naturally go together. She'll ask for peanut butter with no peanuts. She's like, well, then do you want just like a jelly sandwich then? Yeah, make me that. Okay. Um, if we, if, you know, if we're having like chili beans, she's like, I want chili beans, no beans. So I do what any tough parent, I'm not a helicopter parent. I take her bowl in the back, I get a toothpick and I start picking the beans out, <laughs> you know, one by one, you know, like 30 beans in. Uh, she likes bacon wrapped shrimp, no shrimp. She just wants the bacon casing. Which, of course, you know, bacon is like the, the fairy dust of all food groups, right? It just makes all food taste better. Put on a salad, it becomes fine, the bacon in the salad. Uh, yeah, she is that way. Honey mustard, no mustard, so she just wants honey. She is hard to please, and it's especially hard for me as a parent to separate things. Recently, we were feeling kind of lazy, and we wanted to make a quick meal for everyone. So my, my wife gets the big bag of, of chicken nuggets from Costco, right? So it's a lazy day, end of the week. We want to feed everyone. And so she puts everything, and she gave me detailed instructions. And I'm a good husband, so I pay attention to about 50% of those, 50% of the, you know, 50% of the instructions. And I, I forgot one pivotal piece. So she gets the chicken nuggets from Costco and also gets the Panda Express orange chicken sauce which is as good as it sounds. 
friends. I mean, it's, it's glorious. It's, it's, gl- it's radiance in a bottle. I mean, it's amazing. So, so I, I omitted this part of the detail where I took the nuggets out, cooked for the appropriate time, put them in a tup- in like a big Tupperware, like a salad bowl, and I tossed them. I put the whole bottle of, of glaze on the nuggets because who doesn't want chicken nuggets drenched in Costco Panda Express orange goodness? And there, I knew there was a reason why she didn't want me to do all of them because my youngest hates Panda Express orange sauce to drench her nuggets. She would like the honor and the privilege of dipping said nuggets. Doesn't want them drenched, wants to dip. And so I do what any great father does. <laughs> I take the plate in the back, I get a napkin, and I'm like trying to smear off, now casing like, like the breading is coming off. Now she has like chicken clusters, uh, you know, because I'm scraping them off. And I realized there are things that are hard to separate. Um, and it got me thinking about this text. You know, Pastor Daniel kicked us off with verse one and two. Pastor Justice last week gave us verses one through four. And I felt led by the Lord to zero in on the soul's purpose. You see, in Psalm three, it tells us he, that's God, restores our souls. And I started thinking, is, is it possible to separate the soul and the spirit from the body? Like, are we body, soul, and spirit? Are we spirit, soul, bodies? What is that all about? How do we separate these things? Does the word, about, the word of God talk about these things? And I believe it does. So with your Bibles open, Psalm 23, of course we've read it together, but I do wanna read verse three one more time, and then we're gonna dive in. And as we do, we hope to land on this idea that you have a soul on purpose and for a purpose. That God gave you a soul on purpose and for a purpose. Check out verse three. The psalmist writes, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The author of of, of a bulk of the Psalms is King David, right? Long before he was a king, he was a warrior. Long before he was a warrior, he was a shepherd. And it's his time and in the time of Jesus. And even to this day, being a shepherd is not like one of those fancy jobs you love to name drop in casual conversations. It's not like saying, I'm an investment banker. You know, it's, it's not that. It, it's not like, you know, it's PhD, it's Dr. Moreno, by the way. You know, it's not like that. It's like people ask you at a cocktail party and you say, yeah, I'm a <coughs> shepherd. <coughs> Something I do on the side, not a big deal, it's a side hustle. It was not one of these jobs that were highly admired. And that's what King David did long before he was a warrior and before he was a king, he was a shepherd. And I like to think that while he was out shepherding, yeah, that works, shepherding the sheep, maybe he was writing poetry because a lot of these psalms that we get are intimate reflections of his time out in green pastures. So I want you to imagine David not as the warrior king, but as a lowly child doing what he knew best to do to honor his family and honor the Lord in the process. He was a shepherd out amongst his flock. And he writes, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When we talk about the soul, we have to understand what it is. If you're taking notes, this is our outline. When you think about the soul, What is it, why do I have one, and how do I care for it, right? If you you wanna know what it is, we have to discover what it is. We have to discover what is its purpose, and then if it has a purpose, how should I take care of it? I mean, I take care of my dishwasher. You know, I might as well take care of my soul is the idea. And when we look at souls, I, I wanted to draw close attention to this idea that Only two things last forever. The word of God and the souls of men. Hard stop. Let that sink in. There are only two things that will go on into eternity. The word of God and the souls of men. This is because like God's word, the soul is an imperishable thing. Now, where will the soul reside in eternity? Well, that is a choice that we all have, don't we? For Jesus said, if I go away, I go to prepare a place for you. For in my Father's house are many mansions. So there is one location for souls to dwell. You have a choice to do that. And there is another. 
And we will talk about that in just a moment. But I wanted to read to you um, a New Testament passage that begins to try to, just like I tried to separate the orange, Panda Express orange chicken sauce from the chicken nugget, th this passage of God's word begins to separate the soul from the body. Check out, and you don't have to turn that, it'll be on the screens. Third John uh, 1, 2 reads this way. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health, that's the body, as it goes well with your souls. You see, John is one of Jesus' followers. He is making a distinction that your soul is not your body and your body is not your soul, that these things are different, that they're separate. And while I can't separate Costco, Panda Express, orange chicken sauce from chicken nuggets, the word of God is able to do so. And we're going to look at some proof text here. But it's important to understand this. Why does John's letter to those early churches matter to us today? Thousands of years ago when John was writing this, uh, there was an early teaching back then. And this idea happened that there was this group of people called the Gnostics. It's a Greek word for to know or the knowers. And these people would go around and try to convince followers of Jesus that Jesus never died a physical death. They, they taught that he was a spiritual being and that his soul, his spirit suffered, but that his body never did. He never had a physical body. Now I know you're thinking, why does that matter? In a moment, we'll get into that. But this idea that Jesus was just a spiritual being and never took a physical form is popular today. Now, people don't say it the same way, but I know you all have friends and family. You might even be here today, maybe in person or online, where, where you've heard this statement said, I am not religious, but I am spiritual. You ever heard that? See, that's, that's a, a, a child of the Gnostic teaching of thousands of years ago, and it's made its way today. And so the Gnostics taught, yes, we have this secret knowledge that you need. Otherwise, if you don't know it, you could never understand the peace of God. And, and it is no wonder then why, you know, some years ago, there was a big movement to embrace the secret. You remember that? The New Age movement had this book, The Secret, right? These people claim to have secret intimate knowledge, and it related all to these spiritual things. My friend always used to say, when it came to the lies of Satan, there is always real cheese in the rat trap. Isn't that good? There's always real cheese in the rat trap. Are we spiritual beings? Yes. Do we have a soul? Yes. Do we have a body? Yes. But I think what's more important is that you are a soul that happens to have a body. Now, I'll try to separate those things, hopefully better than chili beans, no beans, okay? And, and hopefully in a lot shorter time. The body. We read in the scriptures that God said, let us make man in our image. Now, what does that tell us? That God, that God has five fingers on each hand and five toes on each foot? Maybe, maybe not. But God is speaking to a deeper truth of the human experience. He is saying, I am a tripart being, right? That God is three parts. We know them as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? In the Old Testament, I always used to, as a little kid, when I came uh, to the States and, and I moved up from Mexico, and so there was like a year and a half, and I'm bragging here, where I had to learn the English language, and I did, like in, it was crazy. It was an accelerated pace of time. I was a lot smarter back then. I don't know what happened. But <laughs> in a year and a half, picked up the language. But I remember those first couple months being really lonely as an immigrant. Um, you can't relate to people. You eat different things. Like you just stand out by what's in your lunchbox. You know, it was, I just felt like so different. And I remember when I used to think about God back then and about why God created me, I used to think, well, maybe God was lonely. I mean, I'm lonely. I'm trying to fit in and, and, and learn this culture, study this culture and adopt the language and adult its adopt its practices. Maybe God created me. Maybe the purpose that God created me for is he was lonely. And friends, that is a misrepresentation of the completeness and holiness of God. Because what we realize is that there was community in the Trinity from all eternity. God was never lonely. He had perfect harmony in his relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in the same way, God has created you in his image. You have three parts, body, soul, 
and spirit. The body, how do we care for it? Well, we nourish it. You feed it good food. You give it rest and exercise. And the spirit, a little bit different. The spirit is that immaterial, undefined part that you have the capacity to relate to God. This is your spirit. This is that part of you that when you put faith and trust in Jesus comes alive, where the Holy Spirit whispers to your spirit. The Bible says that we pray that the spirit groans with groanings unknown to man, the Holy Spirit influences your spirit, and then your spirit then communicates with your soul. Now, what is the soul? The soul is also that immaterial part of a human being that can respond to other people. This is where we get our mind and our emotions from. This is, this is the you that is actually thinking, right? When you were a kid, and you got in trouble. I think about my wild child, my little Miss Netta. I ask her, why'd you do that? She says, I don't know. My mind told me to do it. <laughs> right? That's her reasoning, right? And as a six-year-old kid, makes total sense. Yeah, you, you know, your mind is in control. But really, I think there's a lot of adults that think the same way. I cheated on my wife because, I, I don't know, I, my, my mind made me do I don't know, I can't stop thinking about it. But you, your soul tells your brain what to think. Otherwise, you would be captive to that organic matter in between your ears. Think about that. What do you think about when I ask you, what do you think about? There's something beyond the machine that is your brain that is thinking. That is your soul. And it is under the influence of either your spirit or your body. Friends, the soul and the spirit these are two totally different but interconnected aspects of you as a human. And I hope I didn't lose you there. But the goal for today is for you to realize that whatever you do in your body has an effect on your soul. And that God wants to influence what you do with your body by speaking to your spirit. And your spirit, being fed by the word of God, influences your soul, your emotions, your thoughts, your dreams, your desires, so that you can glorify God with your body. Now, check this out. We've talked about what the, what the soul is, but let's look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where he kind of teases this out a little bit further. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, another letter written to an early church, the apostle Paul writes this, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. That means set you apart completely, not just in part, but holistically. And may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here is asking the church, worship God with your whole being, not just your body, but with your thoughts. This is why it's so important when Jesus said, any man that looks upon a woman with lust in his heart has committed adultery. You see how hard it is to worship God with our whole bodies? This is so important. And we were thinking, well, then how do I get my spirit and my soul to, how do I separate those things? Check out what Paul says, or let me, let me back up. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.12, look at this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Brothers and sisters, we all may be able to separate the beans from the chili beans, but we are incapable with human hands of separating the soul from the spirit. But you know what is? The word of God. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It can discern between your thoughts and the intents of your heart. Why does that matter? Because whatever occupies your, occupies your heart, the Bible tells us out of the, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Whatever is sitting on the throne of your hearts is what's going to come out of your mouth. It's what you're going to obsess about. And this has a profound effect on how you lead your life. So what is the soul? In short, it's that part of you that lives on forever, that God wants to influence for his glory, and most importantly, he wants to restore it. But why do we have it? Well, Romans 12 tells us, and it won't be on the screen, but I want to summarize it for you. Paul elsewhere writes, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Why do we have a soul? So that we can worship God with our entire being. Let me try to break this down for you. Why are we constantly tempted to do things that we shouldn't do. In Romans 7, 
Paul says, oh, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says. He's like so frustrated with his flesh, right? Why does this happen? The reality is, is that someone who is not aware of the, of the spiritual health level of their souls misprioritizes their heavenly assignments. And we worship God, not with our whole heart, but maybe just with our bodies, but not our souls. You know, another way, to, another way to, to look at this, and Pastor Daniel talked about this recently, is that we have heavenly assignments, all of us. And the signs of an unhealthy heavenly assignment could be this way. Now, I want you guys to imagine this. What we have seen as we provide pastoral care here at church and we meet with people who are going through hard times, typically what I have seen when someone's soul is unhealthy, right, is the number one idol, and I'm putting my hand this way for a reason, the number one thing that they worship is whatever the, the whims of their body or their hobbies or their interests. I'm talking about the 29-year-old guy that lives at his parents' house that plays 12 hours of video games a day. That's you, right? Just let it, let it hit you for a second. I'm not trying to guilt you or anything, but the idol on the throne of your heart is entertainment. It's a hobby, right? And this could be anything for anyone. We all have different hobbies. But if that's the number one thing that you wake up for, if that is the why that makes your heart cry, if that's the thing that you say yes to every morning, that's an issue. So for a lot of folks, it's that. Secondly, sometimes, sometimes men and, and women alike, we find identity in occupation or vocation, what you do professionally. Maybe that is the idol on the throne of your heart, right? Why? Well, at work, I get recognition. At work, I have an office. I get raises. Um, I'm acknowledged. I can clock in and out. It's where I get respect. And so you typically, not to gender people specifically, but typically men find identity here in vocation. Other people in the relationship, after that, sometimes the idol on the throne of their heart is their kids, right? In Genesis, and Jesus quoted this, said, the man shall leave his father and mother and that two shall become one. What we see as a pastoral staff, as sign of unhealth spiritually and at a soul level is when People are one flesh with their children and not their spouse. I see this a lot. And I'm telling you guys, I'm tempted to do that too. And our kids, I think, ate in that, right? Uh, th that day when I was scrubbing the Panda Express orange sauce off the nuggets, like my wife was like, you better not. And the hand was on the hip. You, you the finger was wagging. Like that's extra. The hip was not quite out, so I knew I wasn't that in trouble. When it's like this then I know, that's how I know, it's like bad. Um, our kids know to do that. They know how to pit us against each other, don't they? But here I am, like a dummy, like ooh, you know. <laughs> we do that, the temptation's real. Other times, long before God is on the throne of anyone's heart, people put their spouse. I don't go to church, pastor, because my spouse doesn't like it when I do. I, you know, I know we shouldn't be in, in this business deal with these folks, but my, my husband really wants to, and I know we probably shouldn't, but I'm gonna do it anyways. I know I probably shouldn't hang out with this group of people because they cause my wife and I to get into all kinds of stuff, but my husband, my wife really likes this couple, and, and you know I don't wanna cause any friction in our marriage. That's a sign of an unhealthy soul when your spouse is on the throne of your heart, and the word of God wants to get in there and... He's surgical. God is so precise. He's so surgical. That's why when you sit at church and we read the word of God, that conviction, I can't fabricate it. I mean, I could do my best, but when we read the word of God and, and something smarts like deep down inside, that's, a work, that's the work of the word of God, fulfilling its intended purpose. It's a scalpel. It's surgical. And then the, obviously, right, the sign of the most unhealthy soul is when God is at the bottom. When the Lord is the last of your thoughts, how can God restore your life when he's not even the Lord of your life? He is either the Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Hard stop. Let that sink in. But what God wants to do as he cares for your soul, as he influences your spirit, is he wants to take this unholy structure that you've created 
and turn it around. Matthew 6, one of my favorite verses. This is a verse my wife gave me when we were dating. She said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added to you. That means you make Jesus number one and if you're married, your spouse is number two. And if you have kids, they're number three. And if you have a job, whatever you do, eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You honor the Lord with the work of your hands. And then number four, you're allowed to have hobbies. You're allowed, but they have to have their proper place. Uh, there's people whose hobby is to serve here at church, and I love it. We're grateful for it. Listen, church could not happen without the grace of God and without the ministry of the volunteers that we have here. It's amazing. There are people who this is where they come and serve, and I love that. But it's important that that alignment is right, that God is number one. Now, why do we invert this? Why do we take this? I mean, it so makes sense. It's so logical, right? God, yeah, makes sense. Spouse, yeah. Kids, yeah. What I do for a living, yeah. Hobbies, okay, cool. If it's so simple, why do we mess it up? I'll try to explain it. It is because, I realized this recently, because our bodies, our bodies are finite, right? They have an expiration date. Um, you get older, like guys, I'm gonna be 42. I'm taking vitamins and supplements from my doctor for things I didn't even know I needed. He's taking things out of my diet like if, it, like if it's his job to do so. It technically is. Like he goes like, you know, he, and don't, do, don't eat this and stop eating that and do that. Oh, and by the way, as I'm headed out the door, uh, no more dairy. I'm like, goodbye happiness. <laughs> no, no more nachos, you know, like just bye. Uh, our bodies are falling apart. The law of entropy tells us that we go from, a, uh, from order to disorder. So our bodies are falling apart. They have an expiration date. That reality is in contrast with, we have infinite desires. Oh, we have infinite desires. Men, your wife will never be able to be affectionate enough for you because your desire for affection is infinite. Ladies, your husband's love will never be enough because your desire to be loved is infinite. That's the bad news. But the good news is something C.S. Lewis said so long ago, you've probably seen it on a Facebook post or something, where he said, if nothing in this world can satisfy me, then I must have been created for some other world. The follower of Jesus gets this. You see, we allow, those of you who have been following Jesus for a long time, you realize that your infinite desires that are at war with your finite created body, that should point you to heaven, to some other world, to some greater kingdom. That is how God restores your soul and leads you in paths of righteousness. For what? For his name's sake. Now, I want to further illustrate this idea of an unhealthy soul. You ready for this? There's a picture. Let's just throw it up there. I'm not even going to tease it up. Throw it up there. Throw it up on the screens. Okay, have you guys seen this thing? It was viral a couple of years ago on the TikTok. If you live in Montana, you probably aren't allowed to have TikTok. I heard about that on the news. But anyways, this is Barack. It's like extra A's in his name, Barack. Barack the sheep. And um, Barack was actually a great sermon illustration because Barack was discovered after being missing for five years. Barack wandered from the flock and was lost for five years. I didn't know this because I was researching this. Did you know that herd animals suffer from anxiety and stress when they're separated from the herd? That'll preach, won't it? That'll preach on the importance of being involved in a faith community, won't it? And so Barack got lost, uh, wandered through five years. This is five years worth of growth. Now, for those, those of us that don't know a lot about agriculture and that kind of stuff, which I don't, I would say, dude, that is like an award-winning sheep, right? Look at all that extra wool. You can, get, you can get all kinds of Pendleton shirts and scarves. And I mean, that's like Pendleton's spokesperson right there, right? Um, but that's before I read up on the dangers of how much extra wool Barack was carrying around. That is to say, he was carrying burdens he had no business carrying because he wandered from the shepherd who wanted to care for his soul. Amen? Right? Isn't that interesting? So let's go to the next picture. This is it before and after? 
So they, they end up, he's so cute, come on. My, that's my guy right there. Uh, apparently, this goes, I mean, the sermon illustration just keeps going. Apparently, this kind of sheep produces merino wool. I don't know about what, what that is, but I guess it's important. And this is why sheep who aren't bred and engineered to grow this much, they can, their wool naturally falls off in the wild. But this sheep was designed to be in community under the care of a shepherd. And this is why they produce so much wool. When they finally shaved Barak, they realized he wasn't all muscle under there. He didn't have a six pack, okay? Uh, He didn't have a shed around his tools, which is to say he had a belly. Um, He was actually way underweight. He was carrying an extra 75 pounds of weight. His legs were no longer functioning. They had to prop him up. The extra weight around his eyes made his, the, the, the skin around his eyes sag and ulcers became to form there. He became partially blind. They had scabs and infections all over his skin. Brothers and sisters, when you wander from the flock, you may look healthy to the rest of the world, but to the God who created you with a soul on purpose and for a purpose can see through the excess baggage that you've accumulated to make you feel special in a world that doesn't really care about you. And that's something we gotta be worried about, amen. But we do have a shepherd. And so, it makes so much sense then for how do we care for our souls? Well, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your what? Souls. Your souls need rest. Your souls need rest. There are things that exhaust your mind. If you're tired, ask yourself, what order are my heavenly assignments in? Is there order or disorder? God wants to transform you. He wants to shave all that excess baggage from you. But friends, he will only transform what you transfer over to him. And for many of us, you're so attached to who you are in the present that you're willing to rob yourself of who you'll be in the future. Friends, fight the urge to cling to who you are right now. God wants to transform you from the inside out. That is to say, from the soul level to the body level. You were created in his image. And if you've been focusing on the body for too long, Paul told us, bodily exercise profits. It it profits little. But when you hold on to your body, you're going to be carried away by every whim of your body, every emotion. And we know we have infinite desires. But that's because you were created for another world that can satisfy you at a deeper level than this temporal domain. If we wanna grow close and have our souls restored, we must be closer to the shepherd who created us in the first place. In Psalm 119, 105, David writes, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lot of us have been running into, bumping into things because we're walking around in darkness. Barak, the, the sheep, I mentioned it, he had ulcers growing in his eyes because the access baggage he was carrying allowed dirt to compile there. He couldn't even see the world correctly anymore. Some of you are that way with bitterness and unforgiveness. It just colors the way you see the world. You're viewing the world through an ulcer, through a cancer, and God wants to get rid of it. Some of you may be saying, okay, Gabe, what do I got to do? Do I got to try harder? Do I got to train better? Are you telling me to be a better Christian? How do I do that? Good news is you can't do it on your own. And that is good news. Um, Additionally, I think you need to focus on something greater than where you have right now. And I wanna give you something to illustrate that. Earlier when um, we were talking, I mentioned David's job was a shepherd. And that was a dirty job, not a fun job. But it made me think about that show, Dirty Jobs. You know that show? I think it recently came back, someone was telling me. And if you don't understand the basic premise, it's this guy who goes and he tries to find the filthiest, hardest jobs, and then he does a day in that place. And really an unintended consequence is it teaches you gratitude about the job that you have. And I think that's a word for some of you today. Some of you cursed the job you have today, but it was an answer to prayer last year. Um, So think about that. 
because it was an answer to prayer at one point. But I love that show. It teaches that, that. And I was thinking, where does my hope come from? It comes from Jesus. But imagine two people who are given a really hard, dirty job. Okay? And they're, they're told to do that job for one year. Both of them. Now, I want you guys to think about the most dirty, hard, scary job ever you can imagine. For me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be transparent here. The thing I'm most scared of, rodents. <laughs> Terrified of rodents. Squirrels, still rodents. Cute tail, but terrifying. Okay? When I drive, I swerve to avoid hitting them. I know you guys are thinking to hit them. So, so I, I go around them. And uh, so for me, the hardest job would either be working, like being like a rodent exterminator or being chained to a desk. That would be like the next hard job. So if I were to combine them, for me, the hardest job, scary, terrible that I could imagine would be being a rodent exterminator accountant. It would probably be the worst job I could think of, okay? So for you, it might be different. You think about your greatest fear. Imagine doing then that for one year. So we have two people. And they're both given the job rodent exterminator accountant for one year. The first person's told, you're going to make 12000 a year. By rough estimations, that is the global income average, 12000 a year. Can you imagine getting up for that job? Whatever your version of the most terrible job is, can you imagine waking up for that job every day for a year? how hard it would be to, to get out of your bed, to go do that thing. It, it, it'll be different for you. For me, rodent, exterminator, accountant. For me, it would be so hard to get up to go to work every day for a year, knowing that at the end of that year, I would have $12,000. But now imagine the second person. What if that second person was told, hey, you're gonna be a rodent, exterminator, accountant, but you're gonna make $12 billion at the end of a year. Friends, a billion is such a large number. If you counted to a billion, and if you counted a number per second, okay, without stopping, it would take you 31 years, 251 days, seven hours, 46 minutes, and 40 seconds to count to just one billion. Imagine being promised 12 billion. Guys, if that were me, I'd be sleeping at work. I'd be like cleaning my boss's car. I'd be, I'd be so happy. I'd be whistling to work because I'd have $12 billion to look forward to at the end of a year, even though my job was impossible. Friends, you have something greater than $12 billion awaiting for you. This is where you get the hope. Jesus said, if I go away, I said this earlier, I go to prepare a place for you. For in my father's house are many mansions. He wants to restore your soul. Have you wandered for five years, for 10, for 15? Come back. Let him prune you. Let him shear you. Let's get at the root of the issue. I love Joe's testimony. I mean, God had been working on Joe for years. It would just happen to be on a Sunday when he was here and we gave an opportunity for, for him to respond to Jesus and it changed his life. But that can be you too. It doesn't have to be just Joe's story. That can be you. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond to Jesus today. You have a soul on purpose and for a purpose. And God wants to restore it. He wants to lead you in a path of righteousness. That means your heavenly assignments are aligned. And it's for his namesake. Because we're building his kingdom and not our own. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I do want to pray. Uh, just for a moment as we end our time together. I will also ask if you can to avoid leaving at this moment. We won't keep you too long, but we do want to give people an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you how it subdivides things. You are surgical with it. You bring joy and encouragement, Lord. And, and Lord, what is inseparable by human means, your word can divide. Lord, we've been carrying burdens. And we need to be shared. We want to come home. So Lord, whether people are here in person or online, would you prompt hearts to want to come home?